Hello everyone and welcome to the Mysterious Worlds. I'm your host Paul Rook and yeah, so here I am. Apologies for not going out last week. Um, I just had a really busy day at work, absolutely knackered. Um, so I thought, I'd, you know, I'll have, I'll have a week off. Um, but this week we've got a really good guest um, joining us. He's an author um, and he's written a book about um, UFOs. Uh, based on his own experiences. So I'd like to introduce Colin Saunderson. Good evening, Paul. Hiya, how are you? Yeah, I'm fine, thank you. Yeah, Colin Saunders. Colin, Colin Saunders. Saunders. Yeah, that's yeah. it. Good, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so how have you been? Uh, pretty good, pretty good. Uh, always keeping busy. There's been a lot of uh, interest in the book. A lot of people contacting me for podcasts. Yeah. Always find a bit uh, nerve-wracking, to be honest. But yeah, I'm getting better. Yeah. The more podcasts I do, the better I'll become at it. Yeah. Exactly. You'll be an old pro at it later. Yeah, <laughs> yeah absolutely. So um, you mentioned your book already. Um, how did that book come about? Well, we had an experience with a UFO 24 years ago. Mm -hmm. and it was a family experience. My wife, daughter, mother-in-law. We'd been out for a bar meal. Mm -hmm. um, so... Basically, I'll, I'll go through the uh, sighting now, and then this is what's le led up to writing the book. So, basically, um, 31st of March 1999, we've been to a pub called The White Line in Paleton, in Warwickshire. Uh, we left there. Uh, my wife was driving in the Ford Fiesta, and there was a, a, a second vehicle in the group, which um, left a little bit after us. They were struggling to get the old lady into the, the Range Rover, so we pulled off in front through the country lanes. It's really dark in the countryside and remote where we'd been for the meal. And we turned on to the Foss Way, the old Foss Way, the Roman road. Yeah. And um, strangely, sorry, strangely enough, just before we turned on to the Foss Way, my daughter mentioned there'd been talk of headless horsemen down the Foss. And we all laughed and said, oh, we'll keep our eyes open for him. And as soon as we turned the corner, there were some lights down in front of us, half a mile away, just hovering by the side of the road. And we all go, what on earth sat there were no lights on the way up it's too low for airplanes and too many lights for a helicopter it was just incredible yeah so we drove up to lights all talking about them all getting excited and um we drove more or less underneath i'd say they were 100 feet away now i based that on steering a, a friend of mine's canal boat um we've got a canal boat that's 70 foot long yeah. so when i say 100 feet i mean 100 feet i could hit it with a cricket ball but the strange thing was, there wasn't a craft there when we first drove underneath the lights. It was just the lights. And it was red with a bit of white mixed in it. It's the brightest lights I've ever seen in my life. Just absolutely fantastic. I've been to a few uh, firework displays in my time, so I love that sort of thing. Yeah. I've never seen anything as bright as this, right next to us. But there was no craft at this point, just the lights. As I stared at the lights, I noticed the sky was starting to sort of ripple around the outside of the lights. And I'm thinking, there's an object there that's it's not just lights on their own so i just thought there were balls of light yeah uh, there was an object and as i thought there's an object there it just decloaked straight away like that and became solid metallic triangular shaped craft and then um the rear end of the craft stayed where it was and the nose rose up in the air like a like a horse like a stallion rising up yeah but it rose up so we could see the top surface of the craft the bottom of the craft was facing away from us we were looking at the rear end and then the nose rose in the air. Now, it's true to say that the rear end stayed where it was. If I show you on this uh, this model I've got here, because it was so close to the ground, if it had tilted from the middle of the craft, it would have struck the ground. Yeah. The rear end stayed where it was and the nose came up in the air like, like so. And okay. it looked like it was alive. It looked like it was organic, this craft, even though it was clearly manufactured. And yes, it's the most amazing thing I have ever seen in my life. But that, and, uh, that model that you've just showed us, is that what you saw? It is, yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. It's um exactly what we saw, basically. Um so my wife, who was driving the car, decided then to pull forward and reverse into a gateway, which yeah. was more or less underneath where this triangle was hovering. And um, the trouble was as she drove forward, there was a hedge that blocked the view. And I thought to myself, it's gonna go. It's going to go now. So she reversed into the gateway. We jumped out of the car. Sure enough, it had gone. There were no signs of any um, 
craft beer in there, no smell of any uh, aviation fuel, anything along those lines. Now we looked around and in the distance there was a craft disappearing, which you've got the same four red lights at the back of the craft. Now, that was massive, that was like the size of a football pitch. I couldn't believe what I was looking at. Mm. And uh, I said to the girls, I, I think that's um, the same craft, but it's grown in size. I mean, I knew nothing about UFOs. I've never been involved with the UFO world. So my first report that I gave to a, a gentleman called Omar Fowler, I put in the report there that I thought the small craft had changed to the large one. I thought it morphed into a big one because it was such a, a weird night, such a surreal experience. Yeah. And I knew nothing about UFOs whatsoever. It was only later on when I started doing research that I realised the large one was probably a mothership that the, the smaller one went back to, although we've never seen it actually leave. <laughs> but it's such a, um, a strange subject. We, we can only guess at what, what what took place that night. But, yeah, I made um, a series of crafts over the models along the way. Yeah. I'll put the lights on this one to show you this one. The, the first one I made basically was this one, which is made out of plywood. And I bought some um, LEDs and a battery pack. Yeah. And um, I printed this on cobble draw and stuck it onto the uh, plywood on the, and with Daryl in as a frame. I made yeah. this about 24 years ago, not long after the uh, the, the incident. So but, is that, that the model of the smaller ship? It is, yes. Yeah, we didn't see any detail really on the larger one going away. Before. Yeah. Size one. This is the, the small one that was next to us that was like 100 feet away. But you see these beams, they, they're raised off the surface, and I couldn't quite produce that with this handmade craft. Yeah. So a friend of mine, John Mills, came along. He's got a, a 3D printer, and uh, he says, I want to make your model for you, which I thought was great. You can see one of them lit up behind me at the moment. Yeah. So this is the first ones that we made. This is a very small handheld craft it's got the lines mm. on top which are on relief they come up off the surface the interlocking lines on the surface yeah on this particular model yeah you can just make it's them right. but it, it, it's not encoded it's not 100 percent copy of what we saw that night but it's along the way now <clears throat> it cost john quite a bit of money to make this little model and um, mm. so i said to him if i sell these on ebay for you could you make me a large model if we sell enough i don't want any money I'll give all the money to you and can you make me a big one? He agreed. So we started selling them. And he also made, you can see in the background, <clears throat> a flying saucer with lines yeah. going around the top of it. And he also made a, a cigar shaped UFO. So we sold those um, and eventually got enough together for him to make me this large model. I'll just switch the lights on on this one. Now, this is the more important model. Right. Now. As you can see, as we came up to the rear of the craft, it was actually tilted at an angle to the earth. It wasn't yeah. parallel to the earth, it was tilted. I think over the years, I think possibly it was tilting towards us. So as we drove towards it, we could see more of the, the lights underneath. I think, you know, yeah. That's the only reason I could figure why it would be tilted. But the thing is, when, when it materialised and then rose in the air, like so, I don't know if you can see on the surface, this surface looked like liquid, looked like it was alive. So okay. Light a bit better. Yeah. You, just, you can see it on there. Yeah, and yeah. Then, so yeah. That, that looked like um, liquid flowing up and down the surface. But you see the beams that are interlocking. Yeah. They were solid on top of the grey liquid, and they were absolutely solid. They weren't uh, fluid, so it wasn't heat haze or electromagnetic effect. The actual yeah. rippling on the surface was the liquid going up and down the surface of the craft. And uh, <clears throat> yeah, <clears throat> this is the uh, most accurate. You can see um, a central light core of the craft, and the top and the bottom are rolled over like like a hovercraft scheme yeah. to join the central core. But there was no uh, welding, no nuts and bolts, no rivets. I mean, it was just absolutely fantastic the craft. Yeah. Now, because these beams on the surface are raised up in three D. Uh, and we never saw the underneath of it, but I was sent a drawing from Omar Fowler from a sighting in Belgium back in the 80s, which mm -hmm. had these lines in relief on the bottom of the craft. So I thought, hey, oh, that must be the same craft as we've seen. Yeah, it's it it very similar, isn't it? So I've used the sighting of the Belgium craft to make the bottom of this to coincide with the top and the rear that yeah. we saw. But I mean, that, that could have been just flat, black for what we know underneath, because we never did actually see the underneath of it. Because the way it tilted up, we just got to see the, the top 
surface of the craft. So that sort of got me involved in the UFO world, and I started researching on the internet, finding about UFOs. I mean, if I was going to make it up, I would have said it was a flying saucer. I didn't realise triangles were so popular until I got on yeah. top onto Google and started searching and it just seems there's a lot of triangular sightings all around the world at the moment. So over the years I went to a few UFO conferences, uh, did a few presentations, I even went to a conference over in America at Laughlin near Nevada, uh, Las Vegas. Yeah. Um, yeah and then more recently once John had built me the larger model I decided to go to a conference in Hull, the Outer Limits magazine conference. Yeah, yeah. I did a presentation, nice. presentation there, which was really well, well received, and I met a real nice couple of gentlemen, the Kinsella twins, Ronnie and uh, Philip. Yeah. And it was Philip who um, suggested I write a book. Well, I, I sort of toyed with the idea, and I thought I'd retire before I wrote a book. But then I thought, well, why not? Why not do it now? Over the last 24 years, I've collected a lot of information from people of sightings locally, of sightings that people have had been primarily triangles, because that's all I was interested in. So I wanted to write a book about my own experience and some of the strange things that happened along the way, which we haven't touched on yet. Um, but to get a book, to get a, a reasonable sized book, I, I had to start introducing other people's sightings and start asking um, in social media, people had seen triangles and could they give me descriptions of what they'd seen, etc. Right. Um, and also, I uh, got a lot of information from John Hansen uh, on triangular craft, uh, with police officers as well. And basically pulled it all together into one book and got the, uh, the infamous Philip Mantle to uh, produce the book. And here we are today trying, trying to publicise the book as much as we can on these podcasts. <laughs> but quite a minute, yeah. I wrote the book to talk about my experience rather than try and make any money out of it. I've never made any money out of this in the last 24 years. So the book is really to talk about my experience and the things that have happened along the way. Yeah. Where, whereabouts can people get your book? Uh, it's on Amazon. It's for sale oh, now on Amazon, Amazon UK. So uh, you can pop along there and, and buy it. I think it's about £11.50, something along those lines. And um, what's it called? It's called Triangular UFOs of the United Kingdom. Um, cool. I've got a copy which we'll perhaps read a few lines from as we go along, but there's the, the cover basically, that's the underneath of uh, the model. Yeah. That's the computer graphics that a friend of mine in Canada did for me. He's done some fantastic illustrations and, and they appear in the book as well. Yeah. Cool. So the, these um, other people that um, you got the stories from, where, whereabouts in the UK are they from? Is it, is it centralised or? No, they're all over the UK, um, Scotland, Wales, England. I'm, I don't think I'm not sure if I've got any in there from Ireland. I don't, don't think so. Although there has been triangular activity in Ireland. Yeah. Um, there's a section on local sightings. Now I live in Hinkley. Yeah, well, I live in Barwon now, which is a village just outside Hinkley in Leicestershire. So mm -hmm. I've got a lot of sightings in there from the Hinkley area, from Hinkley people. Yeah, um, just down the road from me. Is it? Yes, yes. We, um, <laughs> you're in Nottingham, is it? Um, uh, yeah, it's um, just a little town outside Hinkley, actually. <laughs> is it? All right. Where about you? Between um, Hinkley and Tamworth. Oh, right, right. Yeah, so a little market town there. Yeah, small world, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it is a bit. <laughs> okay, have you, have you got many um, sightings from around here? From Tamworth area. Yeah. Uh, there are a, a few in there, yes. There's um, quite a, a detailed sighting actually in there from Tamworth area. Um, I've forgotten his name at the moment. It's a double barrel name, but I'd have to search through the book to find it. There is over 130 different sightings in the book. Yeah. So uh, there's a lot, a lot of information in there. Brilliant. <laughs> well, that's fantastic. Um, so what have you uncovered in your research do you do you think they're aliens or are you more on the fence or you know um no um, um for the first 20 years of um the experience i've generally talked about the nuts and bolts of what we've seen yeah. which is what i've just talked about now 
However, there was a bit of um, high strangeness for me <clears throat> during the uh, during the encounter. Yeah. And then, then I started to have some other experiences afterwards. Now, this all sounds very strange because I am a draftsman by trade. I've worked in the aircraft industry. I'm an mm -hmm. engineer, I'm not some bolts man. And for this to start happening to me was like, quite mind blowing, to be honest. So, basically, what happened on the night when the um, craft tilted up? As the nose rose in the air like this, yeah. all of a sudden, I could see these interlocking lines on the surface close up. It was like somebody got some binoculars in front of my eyes. Yeah. I could see these right up close like this, about that sort of scale. And I yeah. could see, see the interlocking of the bars. Then there was a second view, which was the nose. And the nose was round. It was just beautiful, spherical. It was the most amazing piece of engineering I've seen. And then there was a side view which showed yeah. the central white core and the top and bottom rolled over to join the central white core. Now, without the close views, I wouldn't have been able to see that center, central no, core. No. So I wouldn't have seen it from the aspects ratio of where we were looking at the craft tilting up because we were looking at it tilting this way. Yeah. So when I got back and I was thinking about these three close-up views and <clears throat> as I didn't really know much about it, I was only getting into the subject, I decided that I'd... Uh, out of body experience and I've got close to the craft and that's all I could think of but I couldn't understand why there were three separate views you know from the nose to the side view why yeah. do you see it's wall like that so I started doing a bit of research on out of body experiences and see if I could do it again but I never managed to get around to doing it again yeah but the weird thing was I started to have other experiences after the UFO event I had none prior to the UFO event no paranormal experiences that I can remember in my whole life. Yeah. I was starting to have other weird things happen. Like some of them were lights in the sky, very close at times. Um, uh, splats on the head, um, whip cracks in the car, balls of light in the cloud over the park. But one of the scariest ones was um, something invisible at the river. Right? Say so it'd be, I don't know, a year, eight, maybe less than a year after the event, I'm fishing away and I can hear some footsteps coming across the field. So I climb up out of the riverbank, noise continues, but there's nobody there. But the, mm. these footsteps, there's four footsteps, sounds like two people who are quite heavy, walks right in front of me. Now, from left to right, probably six foot away, and I'm thinking, it's a big cat. And I, I got yeah. really panicky, so I'm way out in the countryside. So I got a spike out of my rod hole that I use for my umbrella. And I was going to use that to protect myself if I could against this, what I thought was going to be a cat. Yeah, it just disappeared in a way. Like, and like I say, I'm an engineer, so like I'm thinking, what's happening here? It's only after the event that I realised it wasn't um, actually here; that it was some sort of a paranormal happening. Mm. One of these uh, space-time contingencies, or something along those lines, that whatever I was listening to wasn't here. Yeah, I stood there. This is ten o'clock in the morning in my waders and my bait apron on, and I'm thinking, this has only started since the UFO sighting. It's obviously got to be connected. So that was the day I decided there and then, to answer your question in a, long, in a roundabout way, I believe the dimensional rather than extraterrestrial. If that craft we saw that night was simply extraterrestrial, once it had left, we would, I would not be having any other experiences. Well, you, you said, other experiences, it's got to be connected. Absolutely. You, you saying about the um, basically the invisible entity whatever you want to call it person um there's a documentary called missing 411 the hunters i don't know if you've heard of it um that basically in the us they're taught they're talking about hunters that would go missing mysteriously and then be found 300 miles away naked dead somewhere um and and various other little bits and pieces like that and um I think the same sort of thing happened to children as well. Um, but there's one particular story in there where a hunter was up in the trees and unbeknownst to them a little bit earlier in the day, there was a UFO sighting in the same town over a football pitch. Um, and as she was up in this high hide thing, she claimed that she saw a, you, you know, like in the predator movies and you yeah, yeah. quote, in, and you get that little shimmer. She claims that she see that. And th there's a good few other stories like that. 
so that might be worth looking into yeah that's interesting yeah i mean when our craft materialized before it became solid it was shimmering like uh, the predator mm. film along those lines yeah so what i could understand about all of this was why i was the only one having these extra experiences my wife my daughter and my mother-in-law yeah not having the experiences so i stood there at the riverbank and thought well obviously the ufo has done something to my brain it's allowing these other things to come in now and is that because of the close viewing the the yeah. body experience so like I say, I was to go to UFO conferences and I went to, um, I used to go to Leeds. The conferences were great. They were run by Graham Birdsell and uh, Russell Callahan from the old UFO magazine. Yeah. That's great speakers there over the years. Well, they met, met quite a few uh, interesting, famous UFO people, Stanton Freeman, etc., Dr. Roger Lear. Uh, importantly, I met Bud Hopkins. I had a quick chat with the late Bud Hopkins. I told him about um, the, the close viewing when we was next to the triangle and I thought I'd had an out of body experience. Now, Bud said to me, no, he says, you've not had an out of body experience. He says, those images were placed in your mind while they was on board the craft by the aliens. Like, mm. Before we got a chance to expand on that, this woman put it in and uh, Bob started talking to her and that was the end of my 30 seconds, if you like. Yeah. <laughs> so I went away and I thought about it, but I didn't really take it on board. Then mm. I started listening to a lot of uh, Dr. David Jacobs' work on alien abduction. He's interviewed over a thousand people, or been involved with over a thousand cases of alien abduction. Yeah. What keeps coming up time and time again is telepathy. You hear this a lot with aliens. Like with the, yeah. I'd assume that telepathy was um, words in your mind going backwards and forwards, like having a conversation. But he does talk about people sometimes having images placed in their mind rather than words as a way yeah. of communicating then all of a sudden out of the blue and I, I put it in the book this email that i got from america this guy said his opening shot was just like you i had three images placed in my mind by the aliens on board the craft he had had a close encounter again with a triangle and he had three images close up images. he says one was pipe work on the outside the other one he thinks was some lights on the outside and the third one he thought was possibly actually inside the craft itself okay and that when he said that when he said that in his email the penny penny dropped i thought my god you're right bud hopkins was right all along i've mm. not had an out body experience it was in fact images placed in my mind from i say those on board the craft but i also say the craft looked like it was alive like it was organic i mean is there a possibility yeah. that the craft itself did that is the craft some sort of really advanced ai technology or is it an actual living creature even though it's been manufactured as such as all of this is a science that we don't understand but i, I believe that it is a science what, what, what's yeah. taking place but it's way advanced uh, of what we understand what, what we know so well we got to uh, write in the book i decided to start asking people who were writing in if they had any other experiences paranormal experiences mm. now strangely enough more people were saying yes than were saying no so in the end, I ended up with a whole section in the book about UFOs and the paranormal. They yeah. do go hand in hand. And there's, oh, so many really. there, there's, you know, countless stories of UFO, the witnessing UFOs or UAPs or whatever they want to call them now, um, and paranormal activity that follows that, even down to um, cryptozoology, because UFOs and the Sasquatch the yeti and all that sort of stuff sort of goes hand in hand as well that, that's another um, yeah i believe that yeah yes i do yeah so if we all take that on board surely that means it's dimensional not extraterrestrial mm. you know if it's just extraterrestrial it, it would just come down disappear and then you would have nothing else happen but the fact that it's dimensional and yeah the, ghosts and other weird things seem to exist between these dimensions you know i think it's all connected i'm 100 certain it's all connected yeah i mean maybe you know when they cross from one dimension to another they sort of break it a bit so other dimensions bleed through as well yes yeah that that's interesting because 
the next day after the sighting, I went back down and we traced my route. Mm. When I turned on to the Foss Way from the country lane, I failed to see how we could have seen the UFO from that distance. I mean, there were trees in the way and, and stuff like that, but it was yeah. we could clearly see it once we turned the corner. The only other way it could have been if it was higher and that actually came down towards it. I don't think that was the case. It seemed to be stationary all the time. Now, a week or so later, I think you've broken up there. Maybe the aliens don't want you to talk about it. You still there? <laughs> yeah, there you are. <laughs> I was just saying, I, I, maybe the aliens didn't want you to talk yeah, about it. Yeah, something happened there. Always a possibility of hearing that, or somebody's hacking into my computer trying to shut me up. <laughs> that's been the thing about this the ufo stuff it's so weird but i'm i'm quite happy talking about it i'm 64 i'm 65 this year and yeah. I'm, I'm quite happy to say what happened i'll put it in the book you know people can read read what took place that night and the things that have happened since then as well yeah okay so yeah um before you broke up you was just saying that you drove up to the field and then you don't you couldn't see how you would see that that's right yeah and uh in case you didn't hear it, uh, my wife went to pick a friend of ours up from the airport and uh, on the way back she came that way specifically to show where we'd seen the, well for her just the lights, which was the craft. Um, and when she got home she said she fails to see how we managed to see it from where we turned the corner. Yeah. She, she said she thought the um, the scenery had changed. Now which is odd because I thought the same. So I was saying, getting back to what you said earlier, perhaps um, we got caught up in another dimension slightly. Yeah. I had heard of that happening before, actually. A taxi driver uh, who had an encounter with a UFO, and he knew the roads ever so well as a taxi driver. Yeah. When he went back the next, next day, he couldn't find those roads that led to where he'd seen the UFO. It was like they didn't exist. It's mm. like he'd been in another dimension for a short yeah. time. I mean, there's also stories of, um, well, in a case, not UFO related. It's more time travel where people have driven through little villages and they've seen, I think one of them was a, uh, they were doing like a flower in bloom type of thing in the village. And then when they went back the next day to see, see the flowers and that stuff, they found the village, but it was completely different. It, there was no flowers to be seen. Um, so they, they believed that they drifted to a, through a time fracture. Yeah, uh, and it's that, that sort of thing, but dimensional, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Um, I've got a report from local in Hinkley. Um, yeah. A friend of mine, he left Nuneaton on his motorbike, I think it was about 1979, um, to drive back to Hinkley, which would only take him about 20 minutes. But yeah. as he came up Coventry Road towards um, Transco, which is the gas uh, central hub, for, yeah. for the UK, as he got closer, he, he said he could see some balls of light flying along with him on his motorbike to the side. I think he said it was a red one and a white one, which he thought was very peculiar. But then as he got to Transco itself, his motorbike stopped working. And he, he just stood astride his motorbike and he said this triangle came over Transco. And he said it was one and a half times the size of a football pitch. Uh, lights in the corner and a glass dome underneath towards the rear end, but he couldn't see any any entities within the the glass dome. But he said it, it glided slowly overhead, massive. This triangle right. and then out towards the town centre. Um, nobody else seen it. I think there were one or two reports in the newspaper, but nobody seen it quite the same as he did. Yeah. So he kicked his motorbike up. It started working okay. So he drove home, rode home, and looked at his bedside clock, and he'd lost one and a half hours. So he woke his parents up to check the time, told them what had happened, and sure enough, one and a half hours of time just dis disappeared on that journey you know, as the triangle came over him. 
but he's got no recollection of anything happening or being taken or whatever. Mm. And there's quite a few in the book where people talk about time, and I am starting to wonder whether time somehow is involved in these close encounters. I'm not saying they're time travellers, they might be, but time just sometimes seems to slip away with people. And I don't think they've always yeah. been and then brought, brought back again. I, I think, you know, the, the closer to the speed of light that they travel, if these crafts can reach those speeds, um, they do effectively travel in time, forward rather than backwards. Um, but, yeah, you're right. There, there are a lot of um, stories as well of people losing time, um, especially in the US. You know, you see see it all the time you know it's like they're driving yeah, along yeah, these yeah. country roads trees each side of the road driving down the middle and then their engine stops and then they lose hour and a half two hours at a time that's uh, right <clears throat> i know um i know our sighting was just absolutely amazing and then i tell people about it and i saw sort of hope they believe me i think most people do there's not many people who go go against it but one thing i've learned is that if I expect people to accept my story, then I should be accepting their stories. And some of the things mm. people have told me over the years is incredible. Like, not yeah. always to do with the UFOs, but the paranormal. Like, and once you start talking to people, and people know that you're involved in it, people start coming up with all sorts of stories. People that I wouldn't have thought would have anything to say on the subject will suddenly say, "Oh, I seen a ghost so and so many years yeah. ago," or well, I seen um, one of ones I always remember is a Roman chariot being drawn by a horse with a, a Roman soldier at the back of it coming yeah. out um the M sixty nine when they were building the M sixty nine motorway through Vinkley and okay. over to Stanton Way. I've asked the guy several on several occasions over the years and it always told him the same story. He said it just sort of come out of the the workings of the motorway and there it was. He said he you could see it full solid horse. It does motorway. it call um Watling Street go all the way down there? That's right, yeah. Now, where we saw our sighting... That's a Roman road. That's right. We were on the Foss Way, which is a Roman road, and just a couple of miles from where we had the sighting is the Watling Street, and they yeah. crossed at a point called High Cross. And there's been quite a lot of UFO activity around that High Cross area. I've mm. got an account in the book by a guy called Mal Autumn. He lives in Sharnford. Uh, he was going to work 3 a.m. in the morning as a, a lorry driver, so he's driving to work in his car comes out of Sharnford in the countryside and there's um near Bumblebee Lane there's a uh, triangle he says it's the size of a football pitch and it's just at like hedge height it's just off the ground by the side of the road uh, over this field uh, he stopped mm. his car got out had a look at it he said it it was massive but it wasn't moving a millimeter it was just hanging there like a picture in the sky and said so it got the beams on the surface and the lights underneath, he said, you could see them, but they were reversed to our lights. You had white in the middle, red in the corners. You had white in the corners, red in the middle. So he got a bit nervous about that and decided, like, you best leave the area. Got back in his car and drove off to work and kept watching it in his rear few mirrors. He drove away. And one of the amazing things about that sighting is it's about six miles as a crow flies from our sighting and just two weeks afterwards. Two yeah, weeks. that is interesting. Real close to the date that we seen ours back in um, March 1999. I think it was two two weeks prior to our sighting. Yeah. So, but and I believe there's been other sightings around that area. Whether the Watling Street and the Foss Way have got any influence on that, because I know some people live in two ley lines. They seem to think that UFOs might follow ley lines. So, there may be something in that. I don't know. Yeah, I would say, I mean, most sightings in particularly the US, because that's where. I've heard a lot of stories from um, the the UFOs tend to follow the military installations where they have nuclear weapons, and I yes, know yes. Rendlesham Forest as well was a UFO hotspot, um, and apparently a UFO was sighted there, and that was a US base in um, Rendlesham. Yeah, that, that was back in the eighties, was it? Nine, 1980, yeah. I think. 1980 when the, the ufos came down and i believe they um interfered with the nuclear weapons either turn them off or, or reprogrammed them to yeah i think they were turning them off weren't they, I think. yeah there's been a lot written about uh, vendorshan forest 
Mm. I've not really, I've not put that one in the book because I think that's been flogged to death in the past by a lot of other authors. Yeah, yeah. I must yeah, I don't really class myself as an author. I just have like, had a, a strange experience and written a book. <laughs> if you know yeah. What I mean. Although Rendell yeah. Wensham is quite an eerie place. I mean, I when we went there, um, we actually walked around looking for this UFO place because they've got a little statue thing at the sighting, clearing. Um, and at the time, I was on crutches because I had a really bad back. Um, and by the time I walked all the way around, we didn't find it, but I found the car, Found the, get, got back to the car. You could wring my T-shirt out with all the sweat and everything because it was a really hot day as well. So I said, I'm waiting in the car while the others went off to look for this UFO clearing. And... Um, as I was sitting there, some strange bloke pulled up in his car and he was just waiting, just just waiting around. When my friends got back, um, they got talking to him and apparently he was someone that worked at the US base and he was supposed to meet a reporter there um, that didn't show up and he claimed that he saw this strange-looking creature running in and out of all the cars when they were parts of the base. And he wow. reckoned it, it was almost like a golem type monkey thing. <laughs> it was really weird. Yeah, um, we, did, we did want him to come onto the show and we said, you know, we'd hide your hide your identity and all that. Um and he agreed, but then he disappeared. Never mm. heard of again. Very odd, isn't it? Yeah, I've, I've seen yeah. photos that people have taken in Rendlesham Forest. There's all sorts of strange phenomenas showing up. Mm. It's a bit like the uh, Skinwalker Ranch in America. Yeah. It's a hot spot, isn't it, Rendlesham? Well, yeah, again, you know, I, I've seen, because because I've not ever actually been there, and I doubt I'll ever go there, um, I've seen the documentaries on the telly, and they are really weird. Um, it's, it's almost like there's clouds of radiation that just, go through the whole area um you know they're, they're picking up energy from the sky and energy from the floor and it, yeah that is a, that is a weird place there's some strange things happening in the world isn't there once you get involved in this subject and you start looking around that's I mean, it that are on the internet there's some proper stuff there and it's mm. weird what's happening yes yeah, i mean really an, another that. another documentary i like watching um is expedition bigfoot and you know, going going back to the whole cloaking alien or whatever it was, um, they they were toying with the idea that there's a there's a legend going around that they can actually turn themselves invisible. That's why we can't see them. And in one of the programs, they shone a light onto a white cliff, and then you see this shadow walking past, but you don't actually see. What causes that shadow? Oh yeah, <laughs> that is really weird. Yeah, yeah, you know. But at the end of the day, it's a TV program, so you, you know you got to take that sort of stuff with a pinch of salt. Um, you, you have. Know, I think we're really back on... some very strange things happening in the world. Very strange. There, there is absolutely. <laughs> so, is is there any other other than the sighting that you've had? Is there any other? UFO sighting that's really piqued your interest that you really want to look into further? Um, there's some exciting stuff in the book. I can read you a couple of um, sa samples, if you like, of ones that I find particularly exciting. Yep. It's also a good plug for the book. Uh, yeah, go, go for it. Plug the book as much as you want. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I don't intend writing another one. It took me 24 years to get around to writing this one. Yeah. <laughs> Right, and um, this is a report from a guy called Charles B from December 2011. So he, he'd been uh, had seen a light in the sky and he, he was discussing it with his daughter. And we decided to look for the light and try to get closer. We saw it one night moving over the Moden area of the town. Is that okay? And yeah. uh, my ex partner tried to say it was Venus, but Venus was also clearly visible and the object was also clearly visible. My ex daughter. Ex's daughter, who was seven at the time, became hysterical and said it was aliens. We pursued the object, which was very bad, but as we followed slowly in the car into North Yorkshire, it seemed to be getting lower. 
We both reasoned it may it was maybe a helicopter, but there was no strobes and no noise. Somewhere between Cleesby and Manfield, we lost sight of it as it got too low. We looked for the object, but decided to give up and turn back home. As we drove back along the A67, I said, let's look down by the river at Low Connors Cliff. With hindsight, I think they told me it was there. After driving down the track to the river, it was probably about 300 feet above ground level. It was huge, at least a thousand feet across. The lights at the apices were dim yellow orange and there was a dimmer orange light in the body towards the back. I got out of the car and stood staring at the triangle. There was total silence. I could no longer even hear the traffic from the nearby A1M motorway. The body was black and it blocked out the stars, but I could see stars around it and also a nearby farmhouse on the hill south of the river. It also seemed to block out the breeze. I don't know whether I got closer to it or it to me, but I seemed right underneath it. I could see black channels etched in the underside of it, which you have now made me think of a docking mechanism. I can't explain how, I've never told anybody until now, but it seemed to be just a few feet above me. It seemed to be made of slate or graphite material, very dark grey and a smooth matte texture. I could feel the presence in my whole body and a dental implant was vibrating in my mouth. I could see the channels covered the underside of the craft. They are probably six feet across and of a similar depth. I raised my hand and touched part of the craft's body between the channels. I was terrified. They even thought it could harm me, but I did it anyway. I pushed my fingers over it and then put my entire palm on it. It felt like a hard kitchen worktop with a matte finish, but it was not cold. The next thing I remember is my daughter shouting to me to come back to the car. She hadn't wanted to get out. So that's a pretty amazing um, close encounter, I would say. A yeah, thousand yeah. Foot triangle that comes down low enough that you're able to touch your hand. Yeah. Underneath. But it also shows the accuracy of these things. You can guide a thousand foot triangle down on top of somebody without actually damaging or getting so close it's just beggar's belief but i believe all of these sightings in the book are genuine i've got no no problem with them yeah uh, so we've we got a question in the chat room from michael cameron um he said have you encountered the famous infamous mib men in black or woman in black after seeing your triangular craft no no, not at all. No, never. Unfortunately, I've had no contact from anybody in authority that I'm aware mm. of. I know in the book there's one or two people who have visits from men in black. But uh, for me personally, no, no, nothing at all. Yeah. Good question, though. Yeah, abso oh, absolutely. Because, um, I mean, that, that's another phenomenon that's reported quite a lot. Um, yeah, there's a local lady who worked in um, Enderby at... Um, place that was called Carlton Hayes which was um, uh, for mentally unwell people um, <clears throat> she'd had a triangle experience and quite, she's had quite a lot of experiences since then as well actually yeah. and uh, I think she put it in the Hinkley Times and then she was at work at Carlton Hayes and she had a visit they said there's somebody in reception wants to see you and there were two men and she says they were in black suits and even more bowler hats yeah. And they were talking to her about what she'd seen and told her not to tell anybody. And she said it was she said she wouldn't, but she said it was all too late because she'd spoken to the newspaper anyway. So yeah. there, but yeah, I've put her uh, her write up in the book about the men in black. So mm. uh, they do exist, they do turn up now and again. Yeah, I mean I I find that interesting as well because they they as you said, they're they're always dressed in the black suits, um, and they wear the bowl hats. There's even reports of them. Although they're they've got faces, they're sometimes distorted. Yeah, in some way, so it doesn't uh, look like they're actually human. Yeah, it might be tinted. Yeah, it, it is very interesting. See, <laughs> secret organisation MIB. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah that'd be an interesting one. I'll um, read you a, another short passage from the book. I yeah, find this one there. It's really interesting. Um, this is from a lady called Lindsay Turner who got in touch with me. Um, okay. Again, I've got no reason to believe this is not true. She was excited when she was telling me over the phone about what took place. Um, mm -hmm. She told me on two separate occasions about this. Um, so I had to write it out for her and check that I got it all correct. So this is what she says, basically. Uh, my, my friend was three years older than me and we were unemployed at the time. We decided to go and visit Dad's property. A 10 to 15 minutes walk away and we arrived at 8 p.m 
The house had a football pitch just beyond the back garden with wild space surrounding it. The weather had been dry all day. When we came to leave late that night, we glanced over to the football pitch via an entrance. We both spotted in the mist a triangular shaped pyramid. So we decided to go and investigate. The pyramid object was the size of a council house and not quite on the ground, but hovering just above the ground by about a foot or two. The pyramid looked to be made of glass and was transparent. I could see swirls of coloured gas inside, yellow, blue, green, in fact, like a rainbow. As they approached the pyramid, it backed away from them. But when they backed away, the pyramid returned to its original position. And this is the bit that, that really got me excited. She says the craft then became solid. In fact, Lindsay described it as being metallic with Egyptian hieroglyphs on all the sides. One of these hieroglyphs was a man with a bird, bird's head carrying a long spear. Lindsay and her friend became nervous and decided to go home, where they believed they lost between half to three quarters of an hour in time. Lindsay's friend plucked up courage and went back to the football pitch, but the pyramid and the mist had now gone. I asked Lindsay if she'd had any other paranormal experience, and she replied yes. And I've put those in the book as well, that she's had some um, experience of ghosts when she was younger. Yeah. I found that really exciting, the fact that there's a, a triangle-shaped craft there with Egyptian hieroglyphs on the side. This is tying up ancient history to UFOs and yeah. a, a technology. It's just... I find that absolutely mind blowing. I mean, there there are a lot of conspiracy theories that associate um, ancient civilizations with the UFOs, especially more so the Egyptians, because um, I mean there is a theory that the Great Pyramids are um, landing platforms for these UFOs. That's right. Yeah, I've, I've, I've never really tied the two together until. Well, I say that, you know, on the night of the um, the encounter, when the craft first lifted in the air, before I got the close viewing, when it first yeah. came solid and rose up, I knew straight away it was um, not one of ours. And the three, three thoughts came straight into my head. The first one was, oh, my God, aliens exist. Mm -hmm. The second one was, abductions must take place. And the third one was, this explains things from history that we don't understand. And that would include things like the pyramids, you know. Yeah. Because I've got the feeling that this craft and the technology had been around for a long, long time. I don't think it had just arrived like in the last 20 or 30 years or since the Second World War. I think they've been here for a long, long time. And the Egyptian hieroglyphs on the side of the craft sort of ties that together, basically, for me. Yeah. No, that does. It is really interesting. Especially when it goes back to the ancient civilizations, you know, because yeah. so, some of the maybe not technology, but when when they have pyramids aimed at the sun and it catches it at certain times and like the winter solstice and stuff like that, you know, it's, I think it's absolutely amazing how they all worked that out. Yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah, I'm sure. That we're not being told everything that's gone on in history. I think things are being hidden from us, aren't they? Oh, no absolutely. Going on. I, th I think the government's uh, worried that it's going to cause too much havoc with people and they're all going to be running around the streets going, oh, the aliens are coming, help. Yeah, that's one side. Maybe, yeah. uh, maybe there's more to it that, as well, you know. Maybe um, for, I mean, I've thought about it. If there is life after death, for instance, and the aliens know yeah. that, then if you knew that as a human being, you'd be less like you look like less worried about the way you live your life here. You might become a bit more reckless knowing that you know you're gonna carry on when you're dead. Yeah. I don't know if there is life after death. I mean, when I had the out-of-body experience, I I was quite happy with that because I thought that meant you could live without your body, and I was starting to think you do live without your body. But then when Bud Hopkins um supposed to be bubble and says it was alien images, images placed in the mind, telepathy, then the out body thing sort of just fizzled away then. So we're back to wondering whether there is life after death. Mm. I don't know by now, <laughs> in a few years, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> so let me read you another um, section from the book. Yep, okay. This is from a guy who now lives in New Zealand. Um, now, this experience is quite similar to mine because he gets some close-up views that, that just appear. 
yeah. when, he's, when he's standing next to a, a craft. Basically, I think they've been out having a, a band practice and they'd seen some lights in the sky and a ball of light and they decided they're going to follow it in the car. Um, so basically, I'll, I'll pick the story up here and give you a quick rundown on what he says. Um, we stopped and got out at the bridge to study the sky, looking for the object. Parked up in the lay-by was a Volkswagen camper van, the sort with a Constantina roof. There was a light on inside and I wanted to go and see if they, if they had seen the object. Dave did not want to want to go. I walked down a very slight incline towards the cul-de-sac and turned to see Dave was saying, no, don't, again and again, pleading with me not to go closer. Don't do it, Rob. I turned and the camper van was not there. Instead, there was a gunmetal coloured wedge-shaped craft, very much like the side view of an F-117 Night Hawk style fighter. It is the best description. It was angular, sharp, pointy, defined. It was more of a wedge, but the angles and the surfaces reminded me. <clears throat> they were not smooth, they were flat. The image lasted one second, and I was instantly on the other side of it, facing what appeared to be its nose. It was remarkably close, maybe a foot away, and it appeared to be alive, but artificial. Same as I was saying earlier. Yeah. The nose, the nose, well rounded and almost like a glove puppet shape, and I had the sense that it was sniffing me. Either side of it, the visible sloping away parts, either side of the nose, had the appearance of being like the cow catcher on an old US steam train. I think that could be like the beams on the surface, the same as we had on our craft. Yeah. Um, they had a pattern to them. It was like a maze, but with segments in it, like expensive chocolate, like a cattle branding iron might appear, or embossed writing paper. I recalled a red element to the nose, but at this point I was unaware of any surrounds at all. At all. I'm being sniffed by the nose of a hovering craft. The nose is gone, and I'm in front of a panel. So he's getting these different views, the same that I did. Yeah. Uh, I'm in front of a panel with that embossed appearance on the side of something that is now looking like the base of the pyramid. As I reach my out my hand, I hear Dave saying, Rob, no, no. <clears throat> my hand goes into the pattern, which now has a liquid texture, like immersing your hand into a bowl of paint. There is an orange lightning flash. And there's a fizz boom, and like the turning off of an old TV on back and the bridge with Dave. And I say, wow, that was really nice. We look up and see three white lights like flying and stars flying away from us in the shape of a triangle. So that is such a strange story. He got in touch with me because he'd heard about my close viewing on the triangle. On yeah. the, the old binocular trick. He's obviously had a similar experience with the wedge-shaped craft that was parked up in a lay-by. Yeah, he's got a camper van and turned into a UFO, which is yeah. and he yeah, immersed his hand of, of all the, the van or, of all the cars he could have transformed into out of the camper <laughs> van. But, um, yeah. no, it was very, very reminiscent of your one as well, wasn't it? Yes, I was excited when I got that, that from him. Yeah, yeah. have, have you got the, any um sightings of this what appears to be the same craft that you did? You saw. Sorry, have you have you had many signs of the UFO that you saw? Um, very similar, but we've got to be honest, we've got 130 different sightings in the book. Yeah, and no two are exactly the same. They're very could be very similar. Yeah, but everything seems to be slightly different. Either the size, slightly different shape, slightly different color, the amount of lights, etc. Um, yeah. But yes, obviously the Belgium site and the looks like it was the same craft that we saw. Mm. Um, I've, I've been through all of the um because I've got much time left now. I'll just run through these actually, because you might your viewers might listeners might find this interesting. I've gone through the hundred and thirty different sightings and tried to find common factors or non common factors if you like yeah. of interest. So for instance, I would have said that most triangles that you hear about, and the majority are dark grey or black in colour. Mm -hmm. But throughout the book, we've also got orange, silver, gold, white, blue, and dark brown, and green as well. That's the colour of the craft itself, not the lights. That's the craft, yeah. so they're different coloured triangles. And as far as the lights are concerned, normally they're red and white, but we've also got green, blue, yellow, orange, bronze, purple, and pinkish colour. Also often described with a white beam coming down from the the center of the craft that you see that a few times in the book as well yeah and 
noise. We we heard no noise on the night of our craft, but the engine was still running the car. The engine didn't start. So over the sound of the um, Fiesta engine, we couldn't hear any noise whatsoever. Mm. However, other people who had been close and outdoors to these craft do report um, like a dull hum, like a transformer, a low humming sound, buzzing, mm. droning. Somebody said it sounded like the sucking of a vacuum cleaner. That's a strange one. The sizes vary from small to football pitch size. And the description, um, often you'll get fridge pipes running along them and girders, like on the top of my craft. Okay, yeah. Some uh, pressure as well. Quite a few people describe pressure when they're close to them. Like the guy, I read the passage where his tooth is vibrating. Yeah. <laughs> people feel pressure when they're close to these craft. Cloaking comes into, uh, into it quite a bit. There's a few people talk about that. We had one guy locally who had a triangle come over, which was half cloaked. He said the cloaking mechanism wasn't working very well. He could see half the triangle and half of it was invisible. Yeah. Quite, <laughs> quite an amazing sight. <clears throat> Other people report it as, as shimmering like tin foil, uh, rippling, black tar effect. Missing time comes up in there a few times as well. And people are saying it looks alive but artificial. And the movement. When our craft tilted up, it was like a submarine underwater. The way it flowed, it was incredible. Once we got on the internet, I started looking at um, different sightings. When people talked about craft floating away, describing it in that manner, I knew they were talking about the same, that they were talking about the right sort of craft, because that is the way they move. And it's described yeah. like it was being fluid or gliding, floating, like it's under, underwater. Um, and sometimes it's been seen flying blunt end first as well which is unusual you'd think it would always be pointed end first if it was yeah. end but flying blunt end first gives the impression it's probably more um, the shape's more for stability than it is for aerodynamics yeah absolutely i mean the, again there is a theory that they form a bubble around the craft that makes them anti-gravity no that's funny you should say that because there's quite a few reports where people are talking about a round ball of light that suddenly turns into yeah. a triangle. Now you see that several times. Maybe yeah. that is the energy field they're using to travel in that you can actually see sometimes. Yeah. But yeah, that that that, that does come up quite a bit actually, funnily enough. That, that is interesting. Yeah. So when, also, when when something's in anti gravity, it's, it doesn't matter what shape is, because it will just drift in whatever direction it's pushed in. Yes, yeah. Um, I did see a, a short video on quantum levitation mm. where if you get a piece of metal and you you freeze it down to zero degrees Kelvin, it turns into a superconductor and then you can get it to hover on a, a magnetic field without it moving a little bit at yeah. all. And you see all the um, vapour coming off the, off the piece of metal. Now, when our craft materialised, when it finally materialised and tilted up, these bottom mm. wing tips here, yeah. little fluffy white clouds, vaporisation appeared on those when the craft decloaked. Okay. And it tilted up. Now, I've got a theory from that video that this liquid on the surface that you can see, mm. perhaps this is something like liquid nitrogen trapped in a transparent skin. These beams on the surface yeah. could protrude down inside the liquid. That would mean all of these beams on the surface are superconductors. They're all down to zero degrees Kelvin and the bottom as well. Yeah. And that would then produce quantum levitation and the craft would be able to hover by using the Earth's magnetic field against its own field that it's created because of all the superconductors that are surrounding the craft itself. And I yeah. think when people talk about refrigerator pipes on the back of craft, I think they're carrying the liquid themselves to create superconductors. Whereas mm. this one's got beams going into the liquid rather than tubes full of liquid yeah that's only a guess. A theory. it's only a no, guess I know. none of us know no that's it you know it's just one of those things you just put it out there and um i'm sure one day someone will pick it up and go actually i'll test that theory let's go <laughs> well i'm sure if me as a layman has come to that idea i'm sure the military have been messing around and trying these things themselves to be honest yeah they're, they've probably yeah. got their own ufos flying around <laughs> I don't know if there's such a thing as the TR3B. Everybody talks about it, but I've seen no evidence of it. But it wouldn't surprise me they are trying to work on some of the mm -hmm. technology. 
Well, that's it. I mean, the journalists are doing it. Journalists the journalists the people know these things exist. The military mustn't know what's going on. Absolutely. Anyway, way, um, yeah, we've come to the end of the show. It's gone really quick. Uh, yeah, it does want to start with our material trade. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's good. Um, so quickly, do you want to plug your book again? Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's available on Amazon, hardback. You can buy a hardback copy or you can buy a uh, paperback. There's also an audio book as well available. If anybody wants to download yeah. and listen to it. Uh, it's available on Amazon right now. And I hope everybody enjoys it. There's 130 genuine close encounter reports in that book. It's a lot of information. Yeah. I'm gonna to have to get a copy myself. <laughs> <laughs> just, just to see the ones around here, that'd be good. <laughs> yes, yeah. Thanks for inviting me onto your show. No oh. problem. Thank you for joining me. Anyway, it's been a blast. Um, and yeah, we'll have to. If you have another experience, come on and tell us about it. That'd be really good. I definitely will. Yeah. Right. Thank Thanks you. Very much. No you. problem. Thank you for joining me, and thank you for everyone in the chat room for joining us tonight. Um, it's been as good as ever um so yeah if you uh you'll just catch me next week on next week's show so thank you everybody and thank you colin uh, goodbye everybody bye everybody <laughs>